This brief preview of Acts chapter 17 and 1 Thessalonians 1 is intended for Bible discussion leaders or facilitators who pose queries for discussion. We will be following the New Revised Standard Version Bible, updated in 2022. Green curly brackets represent variant readings from 5th century or earlier Greek manuscripts. We are in the midst of the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey when he comes to Thessalonica. Ask your discussion group, what do we know about Thessalonica? Be ready to observe that it was a wealthy, Greek-speaking, Roman free city on the east coast of Macedonia province. As a free city, the citizens elected their own officials. Then ask, what do we know about the three gospel workers? Talk about Paul. He was a Jew, an apostle by gifting, reared in Tarsus, but educated in Jerusalem. So he knew the Torah, the prophets, and Greek philosophy. Silvanus is called Silas in the book of Acts. He too was a Jew, a prophet by gifting, sent from the Jerusalem church, a godly man who wanted to win both Jews and Gentiles to faith in Messiah Jesus. The third member of the team was the younger man, Timothy, who had a Jewish mother and a Gentile father a teacher by gifting, from Lystra. There were three kinds of Thessalonian Christians. Be able to explain the difference between Jews by ethnicity or conversion who adhered to the faith of Israel, God-fearers who were non-Jews who worshipped Israel's God without converting to Judaism. And then there were the Gentiles, non-Jews, former pagans. A few important points in the backdrop to this story. From Acts chapter 16, these events occurred in about the year 50 CE. At Lystra in Galatia, Paul and Silas had brought Timothy into their team, three being an optimal number in a church planting team. At the city of Philippi in Macedonia, they had been beaten, jailed, and urged to leave town. There will be mention of the emperor in this text, who at the time was Clodius, who had been proclaimed emperor by the Praetorian Guard and accepted by the Roman Senate. He reigned for some 13 years and lived from 10 BCE until 54 CE. He died at the age of 63, probably poisoned by his wife Agrippina in favor of her son Nero. Coming now to Acts chapter 17, we read, After Paul and Silas had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days argued with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you. You might discuss what was their means of transport, In the day, much travel was done by horse or mule or by hired horse cart. Were they there on three Sabbath days or possibly for three weeks? What was their two-point message for Jews? Namely, that the Messiah, according to the scriptures, had to die and rise back to life. How might God have prepared this synagogue to receive this message? We recall that there were Jews and God-fearers at Jerusalem from many cities of the Roman Empire who experienced the day of Pentecost and the preaching of the apostles. 
Some thousands of Jews became Christians during those days and had gone back to their synagogues in their hometowns. Verse 4. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and with the help of some ruffians in the marketplaces, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. Whilst they were searching for Paul and Silas to bring them out to the assembly, they attacked Jason's house. Discuss this query. What was the importance of women in the advance of the gospel in the first century? And then, what is the importance of women in the advance of the gospel in our society this day? There are in the New Testaments examples of women apostles, women prophets, women evangelists, women leaders, and women teachers. And what was this assembly? Well, this was the demos, where the elected leaders sat making timely decisions on behalf of the city. And who was Jason? We'll learn that in a moment. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some brothers and sisters before the city authorities, shouting, These people who have been turning the world upside down have now come here also, and Jason has entertained them as guests. They are all acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying that there is another king named Jesus. Well, what does the term world, oikumene in Greek, refer? Well, this term usually was used for the Roman Empire, and thus a politically sensitive term. What was the relation between emperor and another king? There were many kings in the Roman Empire, but they were all either appointed or approved by the emperor. And to assert that there be another king, not approved by the emperor, indicated an act of sedition. And to what decrees, or dogmata, do they allude? Perhaps all of the decrees of Caesar, if indeed there is a new king. Verse 8. The people and the city officials were disturbed when they heard this, and after they had taken bail from Jason and the others, they let them go. That very night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas off to Berea, and when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Why did the authorities take bail or a bond from Jason and the others? doubtless to ensure that they would keep Paul and Silas peaceful or send them away. And why did they go to Berea, which lies some 40 kilometers off the main highway, the Via Ignatia, possibly to be safe from authorities or police who might go up and down the main highway? Nevertheless, they had doubtless been led there by the Holy Spirit. We propose a teaching outline for this book, consisting in seven sections. Today, we are dealing with the first of these, recalling the believer's faith, hope, and love. Linguists and scholars propose a semantic-based analytical outline that begins with an action. We give thanks. And the reason for the action, we remember your faith, hope, and love, from which an inference is drawn God has chosen you, based on two premises, our message came in power, and you became imitators, with the result that you've now become an example to others. The reason for this is that the word resounded out from you, and your faith has become known. With the result, we have no need to say so. The reason for this is that Others themselves report to us. Report what? Well, how you welcomed us and how you turned to God. With two results, you now serve the true and living God and you await the return of Jesus. Adopted from Stirner's Semantic Structural Analysis of 1 Thessalonians. Verse 2. 
We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Whom do you and I often remember in our prayers? What three Christian traits does Paul often group together in his epistles? Any experienced Bible reader will be able to reply, faith, hope, and love. To remember in prayer, does this merely mean to recall some past fact? Or does it mean we remember to keep asking God on your behalf? Now, what does love do besides have affectionate feelings? Well, love works by obeying Jesus, who said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And what does faith do? Well, faith labors, believing in results. And then, what does hope do? Hope perseveres despite everything to the contrary. Verse 4, For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be amongst you for your sake. You might discuss together, what are five of God's works in us who believe? That is, according to this verse, what has he done for us? You will remark that he loves believers. He chooses believers to be his own. He displays power amongst them, very often as answers to prayer. He gives his Holy Spirit, and he convicts or convinces of the evidence presented of the gospel. What are the two main responsibilities of gospel messengers? Well, first, of course, to proclaim the gospel, the good news, the truth about Jesus. At the same time, they must prove to be honest, truthful, reliable. Verse 6, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution you received the word with joy from the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Now, what word or message was he talking about? Well, see verse 5. And what are three proofs of true faith in Jesus? First, true believers imitate Jesus. They try to live the way he did. Secondly, they experience joy despite opposition or even persecution. And in so doing, they serve as examples to others. Are you not yourself often encouraged to remain faithful to Jesus when you hear news about Christians who have suffered or even been put to death because of their faith? Where were Macedonia and Achaia? On the map, you should be able to point out that Macedonia is a province in the northern part of the Greek peninsula, whereas Achaia is in the southern part. When the Romans conquered Greece, they renamed Greece the province of Achaia. Verse 8, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. Does this mean that they were going everywhere telling others? Or does the verse mean that news about them was spreading everywhere? Verse 9. For they report about us what kind of welcome we had amongst you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Have your discussion group members identify three actions that true believers do. Listen for these replies. They turn from false beliefs. 
They now serve the true living God, and they are waiting for Jesus, who will save them from the coming wrath. Then, from these verses, what has Jesus accomplished for us? Well, he died and has been raised back to life. And what is Jesus doing for us already? He has begun rescuing us from the coming wrath. From this chapter, let your group members discover several truths that they and you must teach to others so that they become joyful believers. Some of these might include the true and living God, how God loves and chooses believers, how God is both the invisible Father and the visible Messiah Jesus, our Lord. Understand that repentance means to turn from old beliefs to the true God, and the word or message of the gospel. Insist that the word or message of the gospel concerns Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. How Jesus saves believers from the wrath to come and the experience of power, joy, and conviction in the Holy Spirit. Remember that true faith works mainly by obeying Jesus' commandments. When we love others, we labor in their behalf, expecting God to give results. And our hope perseveres despite opposition or even persecution.